right. So uh, welcome back to Pillions Progress, episode two. My name is Richard Nadar. I'm a teacher from Christian Alliance International School, and I have with me... Yep. I'm Pastor Jonathan Johnson. I'm glad to be back with you. Thanks to Richard for letting me come on this journey as we study Pilgrim's Progress together. So what's your feeling so far about our series? What yeah. do you think? Well, I'm excited about it because the book itself is great, as we talked about before, but it's a blessing to be able to kind of chit-chat and have conversation with Richard about it. And also, I hope that even though we're just skimming the content, I hope that it encourages you to dig a little bit deeper uh, because we're really just pointing out some of the most outstanding features of a great Christian classic. Correct, exactly. And, you know, our purpose here to do this particular study is not to give you all the details. All we want to do is stir up a desire for you to keep learning, keep reading, keep thinking, and I would say in that sense, we would have achieved our objectives. So in this, we're going to continue with the Christian journey to the wicked gate. And in the process, he is going to meet a character named Worldly Wise Men. And do you have any information about the character? Yeah, it's good to be back with you. And yeah. it's good as we get into this part of the story because Pilgrim has just gotten out of some trouble in the Slough of Despond. He got some help. And as he makes his way on his journey, you've got to remember he's still got his burden on his back. He's still desperate to get rid of it and to make sure that he has relief of his burden, his guilt, and his sin. But he meets a person named Mr. Worldly Wiseman. And Mr. Worldly Wiseman has some advice for him after he sees kind of the desperate condition that he's in. And his advice we're going to talk about is not so good. Before we do that, uh, Richard had some information, I think, about how worldly wise men, an idea in the world, but maybe even a real character in John Bunyan's life. Yes. Uh, one of the sources that I've read about tells me that actually there was a little connection to worldly wise men. The person that John Bunyan is supposedly referring to is a man named Edward Fowler. Now, Edward Fowler was an Anglican vicar of North Hill, and he was someone who is supposed to be a compromising personality or a broad-minded uh, thinker, and John Bunyan wrote a rebuttal critiquing him on a paper called as the, on the defense of doctrine of justification. So he did address the concern that this particular character was posing, especially the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, that there was no need for Jesus to be the mediator. So I think there is a resemblance to a real-life character. Yeah, very interesting. So this worldly wise man, the reason why he's such a problem in this, as Richard's talking about ideas like justification or substitutionary atonement, some of these ideas are wrapped up in Jesus Christ, his sacrifice for us, and so Pilgrim is on that journey, we're going to see maybe the next week or the week after, to where he really comes to grips with what Christ did on the cross. However, worldly wise man, he distracts him from that, and worldly wise man has the advice, hey, if you want to get rid of your burden, if you want to be rid of your consciousness of guilt, and if you want to be reunited with your family, be accepted in the world, all you got to do is go to a nearby village called the Village of Morality. And so his advice to him is actually going to get him off the right path and try to give him a different way to get rid of his guilt and his feeling of sin. And we're going to see there's a lot of trouble that uh, comes into Christian's life because of this. So, as uh, Pastor Jonathan just talked about that, so the worldly wise man was an interesting character, but he was offering an easy way out. You don't need to believe the Bible. You don't need to follow uh, the principles that he's talking about. Take an easy route to uh, take off your burden. So that's the offer the worldly wise man was uh, giving to the uh, pilgrim. And in doing that, one of the important things he was also mentioning that you can eliminate suffering. You don't need to go through suffering. I mean, you can have an easy path towards the wicked gate or for that matter to the celestial city. You don't need to go through this. And that is a, a kind of a scorning attitude of the worldly wise men. Now, I was reminded of something that uh, came up in the year 2000, around 1970s or 80s, which is uh, called as the Jesus Seminar. Now, what these group of scholars did, some of them were uh, probably well-known, some of them prominent. There were like 200 of them. I don't know to what spectrum did these scholars come from, but they were liberal in their mindset or attitude because we got to know that some of them 
had more leanings towards scientific naturalism or a naturalistic outlook. So they denied the Bible, uh, they denied miracles, they denied whatever supernatural being out there. Now, one of the important things they did is that they actually looked at the Bible to find out who is the historical Jesus. And they want to separate the historical Jesus from the faith of the disciples. So they wanted to do this dichotomy. Now, the interesting thing is that in the process, they color-coded the Gospels as red, pink, um, gray, and black. Red symbolized the words that Jesus actually said. Pink, possibly, he said. Gray, most likely, he would have said this, or maybe the disciples added something to it. And finally, black was that he never said it. So, you know the ironic thing is that they actually got rid of the Gospel of John because they thought it's black. Like, there's nothing that Jesus said. So you see that the Jesus Seminar was a modern critique of the Bible. And uh, that's kind of a similar mindset that the worldly wise men was having. Apart from that, uh, what do you think about other forms of moral aspect like self-righteousness? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, as Richard's talking about this idea with the Jesus Seminar, even back in the day of John Bunyan, there were people who were saying... You really can't rely on the Bible. You can't trust it. And in worldly wise men's sense, he's saying, put the Bible away. That's where all your troubles came from in the first place. And he advises him to have this self-morality or a self-righteousness that was somehow going to make him feel better. And if there was a God, to make him right with God. And now, of course, to be moral and to try to be a good person is, is fine. But we understand from the teaching of the Bible that our, our self-morality or our self-righteousness could never save us. That's the whole message of the gospel. The bad news is we're in trouble because of our sins. That's what Pilgrim is feeling. Right. And the good news is that salvation has been completely provided by Jesus Christ alone, his work on the cross. So you can see worldly wise men, as he says, put away that Bible, stop reading that. You can take care of this yourself by living a right life. And the good thing is, as you do it, your suffering will stop and you'll be respected in the community. So he's really trying to offer him a a better way, a more beautiful way than he was following from the Bible. Right. And uh, I think this is, to some extent, there's also a portrait in the Bible of the prodigal story, the son story, mm -hmm. where you have the older son who was unable to accept the younger son because he wasted his life in licentious living. The older son is a, uh, is a model to some extent of what self-righteousness is all about. And uh, that's tragic because uh, you can pretend to say, I know God, you can talk about God, just like worldly wise men. He was a very smooth talker, but he was lost in the sense that uh, his focus uh, was on self-righteousness. So what do you think happened? Uh, did Christian fall prey to the door of the worldly wise men to, you know, take an easy path? Yeah, I, I think at least for a little while he did, Richard, you know, because we can kind of sympathize with Christian. He's already got into some trouble. He already got into despair and the slough of despond. And now somebody comes along right away and says, hey, listen. There's an easier way. You can still be religious and not have any trouble. So he does uh, get redirected. And the place that he's going to head to, Worldly Wiseman says, is called the Village of Morality. And he needs to go see a man there named Mr. Legality. Now, legality is the idea of trying to keep the law. And in this particular case, to try to be justified by the law in the, the biblical sense. But the good news is, as he goes to this place of morality to see Mr. Legality, the way, it's very difficult. Maybe Richard can explain why it was so difficult or what that experience was like. Yeah, before I go to that, what I found ironic about the Christian is that when the worldly wise man was having a conversation, uh, the pilgrim never checked the Bible yeah. to say, hey, is this the right thing yeah. I need to do? Is this the truth? He never verified it. Yeah. So anyway, he went to this village of morality and as he is going up, the road is quite steep and there is what is called as a high hill and he saw as if the hill was caving in and his burdens actually in, in, instead of getting lighter it was becoming heavier and heavier and that's tragic and the christian gets scared he's afraid of it as if you know it's going to fall on him 
what is the symbolism? What does it represent? Yeah, so it's really nice because yep. there's at least two things going on. I mean, the the picture in the Bible we have pretty clearly is kind of the picture of what we say Mount Sinai because that's where Moses received the law. And the cool thing is, in the Old Testament, Mount Sinai, when Moses received the law, that was a scary experience. There was lightning and fire, and the people at the bottom of the mountain were scared as Moses received the law. And so people like the Apostle Paul in Galatians, and even in the writer in the book of Hebrews, would say, that's what the law is to us. It's intimidating, and it's scary. And if you try to be perfect by keeping the law, you're going to fail. Unless you're a very arrogant person, if you're honest, you realize you cannot keep the law. And so this hill represents how when we get closer and closer to God's perfect standard, our burden and our guilt just gets more and more and more for the honest person. Yeah, and anybody who has read the Old Testament will know that what the law does is it brings about a curse, a condemnation for disobedience. So what the law does is definitely reveals our real true desires. And I was reminded of a story that's quite true, uh, accurate, in the sense that people have a really amazing way of catching monkeys. And one of the things they would do is they would have these, uh, you know, huge bottles and they would have a very narrow neck. The neck is so sufficient for the monkey to put his hand in. But when he closes its fist, it won't be able to get it out. So what they did is they have this bottle, they put some peanuts inside, you know that monkey love peanuts. And uh, as they set this trap, they wait for the monkeys to come. So the monkeys come, they put the hand inside the bottle and they want to grab it, but the hand doesn't get out. And so uh, he wants the nuts, but then he also sees that these hunters are approaching him. And so I thought the easiest thing is let go the peanuts and run. But the monkey is so um, addicted and desirous of these nuts that the hunters would just come and pick them up. So what you see here is what human nature is. We know that certain things are not right, but it is the fact what the Bible says, the heart is disciple, and that's a reality. <laughs>
Okay. The other thing that really comes to my mind in our culture about legalism, we are talking about self-righteousness, we are talking about having your own standard of morality. Uh, I was reminded of this uh, movie called Batman and the Dark Pieces. And I find this movie quite fascinating because I'm trying to wonder as to who is the protagonist. Is uh, Bruce Wayne the vigilante who is the pr protagonist or is it the Joker who creates chaos, who is uh, commits all kind of evil? Is he the protagonist or the people of Gotham? Are they just bystanders? who basically enjoy watching these things and uh, so I'm beginning to wonder what is this but most importantly I begin to ask in this whole narrative where is God uh, where is where is moral law so uh, according to Bruce Wayne who is struggling with power seems to be the right guy he's the guy who can protect the society or maybe Joker who wants to rise above and uh, he's doing everything to protect his people maybe he is right or what about the people of Gotham who are just bystanders or watching city burn? So you begin to wonder what is morality, what is moral standard? Each one can be so self-righteous in their own way. So apart from the Bible, in terms of God as the moral law and the moral lawgiver, I don't know if we have any other standards of morality. You know, I don't see that in our culture. So our culture needs to understand that, that any kind of moral law, any kind of righteousness needs a standard. And uh, you have to eventually come to the Bible and say, hey, God is the standard of morality and everything will be judged based on that. So the good news is after all of this very difficult reminder for Christian, very hard struggle, he does get on the right path. He, he cries out to evangelists and says, is there any hope for me? And it's very nice because evangelist says, yes, if you will get back on the right way and not be distracted by this false morality, false righteousness, you can be saved. So he makes it all the way very quickly to the place we call the wicket gate. And if you've been reading in the story, you'll, you'll know already that's wicket with a T and not with a D because it's not a wicked gate. But wicket is the idea of a very small, narrow and kind of a homely gate. And when he gets there, he gets to the doorway, and he starts to knock. And he's knocking, and he doesn't get in right away, but he keeps knocking, and then finally the door opens, and the gatekeeper reaches out and pulls him in. And the gatekeeper's name is Goodwill. And this is a nice way for us to see that God is willing that those who are seeking after him should be saved. But he pulls him in very quickly because he tells him later, from the Tower of Beelzebub, the devil is trying to shoot at at uh, Christian and others with fiery arrows. And it's kind of the idea that there are people who are maybe seeking after God, who are interested in, in Jesus Christ, but the devil with his arrows distracts them. Maybe he tells them, oh, you've got, you've got lots of time. You don't have to worry about this. Or you, maybe the devil shoots them with an arrow and he says, hey, you know what? There's so many religions out in the world. How can there just be one right way? But some way the devil present, prevents people from entering in. And thank goodness, Christian makes it into that mm -hmm. narrow gate there. Right. And that is the desperateness that the Christian is experiencing because he's keeping on knocking on the door. He just want to get in. And that's the story of all those people in the Bible who see the desperateness of what it means to come to a relationship with Christ. But I also see the negative side of it. People who so fall in love with the world and the things of the world they choose to retreat. For example, I'm reminded of Lot's wife. She's running towards so-called wicked gate. God says, you know, uh, run to the mountain, nearest mountain or nearest place. And uh, the whole family runs, Lot and his daughters and his wife. But somehow her heart was left behind in Sodom and Gomorrah. And she looks back and she becomes a pillar of salt. So there are people who have heard the gospel, who have uh, experienced uh, some aspect of God's blessing, but their heart is still left behind. So what happens after this? Yeah, so he gets inside the gate, and really this is one of the ways, although we'll talk about it later, one of the ways that we see finally Pilgrim, or the man in rags, we're calling him Christian, finally this is where we can say he, he's in that safe relationship right. with God. Maybe we sometimes in language would say he's saved, right? And we'll talk about that next week. But as he gets inside, he's going to be taken to a place called the interpreter's house. We're not going to get into that yet, 
But this is where he begins to start to mature as a very young Christian, like a baby in Christ, and he starts to learn things about the Christian journey. So I hope that gets you excited because all of us need these reminders we're going to see inside of Interpreter's House. But that's where he's headed to next. Right. And uh, that will open door for more things to discuss about. So, But then one of the things that um, I realized is, uh, is part of the language of the Bible is called justification. Mm -hmm. So I think to some extent, the Christian now experiences the whole idea of God's grace where now he is right with God, just as if he is without any sin. In the sense that now he has the robe of righteousness being put on him and he stands what you call perfect or righteous. So that's uh, biblical language or theology of justification. I think we'll, we can talk more on this in our following episodes. Any closing yeah. comment? Yeah, just uh, hope to press it home to you because maybe you're listening to these or you're reading through the story and you are a Christian. Uh, this is encouraging to you because you can look back at your experiences and be reminded how easy it is to get distracted whenever you stop checking things in the Word of God. But maybe you're listening to these stories and you're not really a believer in Jesus Christ. You're not a Christian. Uh, you have not had this kind of experience. And for you, I hope that you feel some kind of urgency, right? Because the worldly wise man speaks like the whole world and says, it's okay, you can work your way into heaven. But the message of the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress is, no, there really is only one way, only one truth, only one life that's found in Jesus Christ. And you also need to remember that idea of the, the devil shooting those arrows at you. It's supposed to be scary. It's supposed to motivate you to get in and to have this justification before it's uh, too late, we would say. So I hope you read the story again with that in mind. Yes, you may have a lot of questions, but I would like to have you think about what Ansam, mm -hmm. who said that I don't understand and then I believe. Mm -hmm. It's I believe first and then I understand. So if you are reminded of what uh, Pastor Jonathan talked about, Pascal's major, then the best way is to believe and understand and you will discover more about what this journey of being a Christian. Yeah, that's great. My, yeah. my grandfather had said once, uh, he said, when you get on an airplane, unless you're a pilot or an engineer, you don't understand how all the parts work, right. but you trust it and you get to where you're going to. Yeah. And many things we would say from the Bible are like that. We don't have to understand it before you take in the benefits. Good. Okay, friends, that's all. I would like to uh, end this episode with the pilgrim getting into the house of interpreters. We'll talk more on that. Okay? So thank you for joining us and spending your valuable time. See you next time. Bye-bye.